can be found on our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding for the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Jeff Barnes is a native of Omaha. He is an independent historian and also serves on the Board of Trustees for the Nebraska State Historical Society. He's the author of uh, Forts of the Northern Plains, which is a guide to historic military posts uh, of the Indian War period. His latest effort is titled The Great Plains Guide to Custer. And the title of uh, his talk today is 10 Must See Custer Sites on the Northern Plains. I'd like to welcome Jeff. Thank you very, very much, and uh, happy fourth week of spring. <laughs> well, I was really excited Tom asked me to give this presentation. Uh, this, is, this is one that I've wanted to do for, for quite some time, but um, I'm a speaker with the Humanities in Nebraska, and this isn't the program I give. So this may be the one and only time that you see this program, but it's something that, oh, wait a minute, what's this? Tom, how would we get locked here? <laughs> I guess we did something so, well. This is something I haven't visited yet. <laughs> okay. Well, in the meantime, um, this is this is something I put in um, put in for Tom for this presentation. He wanted to see a little bit more about the sites of the Great Plains and associated with Custer. And there we go. And uh, this is, this I think, would be pretty fun here with this. Um, my original title for this was 10 Custer Sites to See Before You Die, but that's kind of gruesome. <laughs> and uh, there's actually a couple sites on here that could kill you, so I'd, I figured I didn't need to, need to pile on to that. But, uh, but uh, we'll take a little tour around the, around the Great Plains here. And uh, these are not arranged in order of importance. I'm following a, a chronological order with these, so... Um, that that's, explains the order that they're in. And I'm actually going to start way at the south there, down at Austin. And this is the Custer House from 1866. This is Custer's first command on the Great Plains. This is immediately following the Civil War. Um, he was sent to, sent to Texas, ostensibly to, to round up any resistance, any uh, rebel resistance that was still going on. But also, uh, France was kind of agitating Mexico to start something up with America at that time as well. So that with the show of force with the cavalry down in Texas, that was thinking was that was going to keep, the, keep uh, Mexico and France from doing anything down there. But uh, when Custer came to Austin, he had been offered several, several large homes as his headquarters, and he turned them all down and instead opted for uh, Building 19 there, which is the Texas Blind Asylum. And uh, this is a photograph of that, fairly famous photograph, but uh, Custer and his staff, their headquarters is actually on, I don't know if I can clip that on here. I guess that's going to stay here. Uh, Custer and his staff occupied the main floor there, and Libby and Custer occupied the second floor of that. And if you go there today, this is, this is what the building looks like. It's now part of the University of Texas campus, which is, explains the burnt orange trim around the building. Uh, they, nobody has any idea of what color that actually was was before the University of Texas took it over, but it's now their Center for American History and has been restored very, very nicely. This is another well-known photograph associated with the, with the Custers at, the, at Austin. And you can see George and his wife Libby there. Uh, that's his brother Tom. His father Emmanuel Custer is back there reading the paper, and that's his servant Eliza. Uh, this is such a well-known photograph that when I was down there for the Order of Indian Wars for their conference in 2009, we had to reenact uh, that photograph again. And uh, some of you folks may recognize Robert Utley, uh, former chief historian with the National Park Service, very, very well-known historian. That's his wife, Melody, there. Uh, to the left here is Jim Donovan. He is the author. Um, I imagine quite a few in this audience have already read his book, A Terrible Glory, probably one of the best uh, history's ever written on the Battle of Little Bighorn. 
And uh, if you'd like an opportunity to meet him, I'd give a plug for this right now. I'm the sheriff of the Omaha Corral of the Westerners. He's going to be our lead speaker uh, starting up this September. So um, check with me afterwards. I'll give you information on, on coming to see him if you've got, got any books you need signed. Uh, the next spot on the Great Plains is Fort Riley. And it was here in 1866 that the 7th Cavalry was organized along with the 8th Cavalry. Now the Kansas Pacific was making its way across Kansas at the time. They knew they were going to be needing cavalry to respond to the, to the threat from the Sioux and the Cheyenne during the construction. And uh, Fort Riley was set up as the, as the launching point for this. And that took place on an open field to the left here of the former territorial capital of Kansas. And uh, that building has been restored. It is today operated by the Kansas Historical Society. And kind of kind of interesting thing going on here. This is owned and operated by the Historical Society within the Union Pacific right of way on the Fort Riley Military Reservation. So I can imagine the paperwork that's <laughs> involved in, in something like this going on here. A lot of red tape, but uh, they've done an excellent job on the restoration for that. They've got a nice little museum on the main floor of the building. Uh, the second floor has a nicely restored meeting hall. Uh, I'd love to give a presentation here. This is just, this is just wonderful with, with this. But also on the Fort Riley uh, Reservation, uh, just to the north of the parade ground, is a uh, structure identified as the Custer House. It's actually the left part of this duplex here. And it was called the Custer House because in um, you know, some surveying of the house in, in the 1930s, they found some papers that were signed by George Custer within this, uh, within this uh, quarters here. And so they naturally assumed this is where George Custer and Libby lived when they were at Fort Riley. Well, they, f they found out years later that he actually lived in another officer's quarters on the post. This had nothing to do with George Custer, but that other quarters that he lived in had already been destroyed by fire. So they, they kept going with this. This has been furnished uh, to represent uh, that what it would have been in George Custer's time, and it's still portrayed as the Custer House, even though he may have never walked into it at all. Uh, the next stop takes us into Nebraska, and uh, you know everybody in the room here has heard of Custer's last stand. Well, if you have a last stand, you had to have had a first stand, and this was it. This was in Nebraska when uh, Custer and the Seventh were encamped along the Republican River in southwest Nebraska. Uh, at this time, uh, the Seventh had been attacked by a group of uh, Sioux warriors led by Pawnee Killer, attempting to drive off the horses of the. Uh, of the seventh, and you can see this as depicted in Harper's Weekly uh, by uh, uh, Theodore Davis, and this is a sketch of that. Uh, in response to this, Custer called for a conference with Pawnee Killer to try to find out why they were being attacked. And uh, during the discussions, uh, warriors kept slipping into the discussion, <laughs> and it got to the point where Custer finally said, hey, if, I, if we see any more of this happening, we're going to sound the trumpet in a charge. And so at that point, the warriors stopped arriving, but the discussion ended at that point, too. But, but this was Custer's, Custer's first stand. Uh, this is the field in which the, the 7th Cavalry was camped. This is just outside Benkelman, Nebraska, and uh, the state... Historical Society does have a marker on Highway 34, uh, about a half mile from here, uh, which commemorates General Custer in Nebraska. And I think, the, you know, the interesting thing about this, Custer's first stand, this took place on June 24th of 1867, nine years and one day before his last stand. And uh, just a few, a couple weeks following this, this was the Kidder Massacre in 1867, just a few miles south of Nebraska in Kansas. And this was George Custer's first look at Indian warfare. Um, he had been having a horrible, horrible time on the Great Plains. He had been chastised by General Hancock at Fort Hayes, been chastised by General Sherman at Fort McPherson. Uh, he was suffering the highest desertion rates uh, among the, the troops on the Great Plains at the time, uh, 35 in one day while they were encamped in Colorado. Uh, missing his wife horribly, uh, there was a cholera outbreak going on on the Great Plains at that time. He had been riding back to Libby, 
uh, asking her to join him on the plane, so he's a little worried about asking her to do that with the cholera outbreak. And he was also hearing these rumors about uh, an officer back at Fort Riley paying undue attention to her. So uh, he just had a cascade of things going really, really bad for him. Then he came across this, uh, the troops of uh, Lyman Kidder, uh, who had been uh, sent out to deliver message, or uh, excuse me, dispatches to Custer, got cut off and, uh, and got uh, pretty much wiped out by, by Pawnee Killer. This is a sanitized version of what they found. None of the bodies were recognizable when, when they were discovered, uh, burned beyond recognition. In fact, Lyman Kidder himself was only identified much, much later because Custer had remembered uh, he had been wearing a fragment, a fragment of a shirt that his mother had made from, and he was able to uh, let Kidder's fi uh, family know that he, he did recognize a body with that and we're able to come out and retrieve his, his body as well as the rest. But uh, this, is, this is a horrible, horrible thing. And I think it may have been the tipping point for Custer at this point because shortly after this, he pretty much deposited the troops of the 7th Cavalry at Fort, uh, Fort Wallace and took off on a mad dash across Kansas to find Libby. And he did find her, but he also found uh, a court-martial waiting for him at uh, Fort Leavenworth for, for that reason. And uh, if you go to the site today, there is a marker very close to the site, which uh, gives a little bit about the facts of the Kidder Massacre. Uh, this is on a, on a county road. I, I believe it's a state road, but it's, it's gravel. Uh, you can get out to the site, however. There, there is a private road there. Well, if, if you call it a road, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not really a road. But um, I'm thinking in the warmer months, you really don't want to walk it because there are, are rattlesnakes in the area. Uh, so if you do choose to go out and see the site, uh, you can take your car about as far as you can, but just try to stick close to, to Beaver Creek there. And eventually you'll come across the, uh, across the marker for the Kidder Massacre. And this was erected in 1869. Uh, following year, much better for Custer. This was, uh, he had been called back to duty uh, to initiate what uh, was a, a new tactic for the Army, and that was a total war and involved a winter campaigning against the Indians. Uh, what was involved here was, uh, was Custer and the 7th Cavalry uh, meeting down at, uh, at Camp Supply in the Indian Territory. The plan was to attack the Indians in their winter encampment when they would be at their weakest, uh, when they would not be expecting an attack. And uh, this began in November of 1869, and just uh, just as, as they were leaving Camp Supply, the 7th got hit by a snowstorm that uh, hit them for about four days until they did reach uh, Black Kettle's camp on the, on the Washita River on November 27th. Caught them completely unaware of this. Uh, about 40 to 60 warriors were estimated killed in, in the attack. Uh, 53 women and children taken hostage. Um, it was seen as a success because it, it pretty much ended the... the uh, the Indians' uh, security in, in the Indian Territory. They knew they could be attacked at any time uh, with, with the winter attack going on. Uh, didn't fare too well f totally for the 7th Cavalry, though. They lost, uh, lost a couple officers, including Major Joel Elliott, who took off on, in pursuit of some warriors with his troops and uh, were, were cut off and, and killed. Uh, but if you go to the site today, uh, this is the Washita River. It's not much of a river. You could easily walk across this. But uh, this, is, this is where the initial attack began. Um, for many, many years, the only thing that uh, you had for the interpretation of the battle itself was this marker to the right and this observation platform, which overlooks the Washita River Valley. And it has a little, few little uh, instruments there to tell you what, what you're seeing and where the attacks took place. Um, my in-laws live down in the area, so I've been visiting this site for about, about 30 years. Uh, this was the only thing available for many of those years. And uh, I, I did something I'm not proud of, but I did hop the fence and make the trek across the, the farmland and over the railroad tracks to get to the river. I wanted to actually be on the site, so I did not ask permission. I always advise asking for permission. But in the, in the following years, uh, they have uh, uh, the... National Park Service has taken over, or the National Grasslands has taken over the site. Uh, they do have trails coming through there now. The railroad tracks are gone. And in recent years, they've added a visitor center uh, for the interpretation of the, of the battle. They don't have a lot of artifacts. Uh, there aren't many artifacts that remain from the battle. Uh, they do have a very nice uh, 
very nice film on the on the battle itself, though. Uh, this one, we come back to Nebraska. This is the Royal Buffalo Hunt of 1872, and this is Custer's last celebrity hunt. On this particular hunt, uh, he was involved with uh, probably the greatest celebrity in America at the time, the Grand Duke Alexis of Russia. Uh, when Alexis came to America, it was sort of like when the Beatles came. I mean, everybody was swarming out in huge crowds to, to, uh, to meet him or a chance to see him and uh, had the opportunity, had a little bit of free time and asked if he would like to go buffalo hunting in America. And uh, He's an avid hunter and for the opportunity to do that, he did, did agree to that. Um, I'll come back to this photograph in a bit here, but I'll give you a little bit of background on Custer and his celebrity hunts. When he was at Fort Hayes in Kansas, he um, started writing articles about his hunting and his adventures on the Great Plains for an outdoor magazine. And folks would start to read these, and members of Congress, uh, uh, tycoons of industry, visiting dignitaries, celebrities like P.T. Barnum, they started making requests to come out and join Co uh, Custer on, the, on these hunts. And that's Custer in, in one of these buffalo hunts outside of Fort Hayes. And if any of you have been around Buffalo before, you probably know this. If you see the tail go up, you don't need to worry about that end of the buffalo. It's this end you need to worry about because you've obviously angered him enough. He's getting ready to charge. So I think this poor fellow's dispatched not too long after this photograph was taken. But uh, anyway, for the, for this grand hunt, uh, Custer, Sheridan, and a number of other officers came to Omaha in preparation for the Grand Duke's arrival in Omaha. And this is a photograph taken at that time. Uh, Custer loved cameras. He's probably the most photographed officer of the Civil War. And if there's an opportunity to have a photograph be taken, he was going to do it. Now, this particular photograph uh, is owned by the Kansas Historical Society. They had only identified it as being taken by Edric Eaton and probably in January of 1872. They didn't know any of the details from that. Well, I did find out from, I can't, I saw Jim Potter here. I don't, Jim, I don't know if it was you that told me or it was Doug Scott that told me, but this particular chair that Custer's sitting in only appears in Edric Eaton's Omaha photography. Uh, he was a Great Plains photographer and traveled the Great Plains, but any shot that you see with this particular chair had to have been taken in Omaha. So from that, we're able to center Custer, Custer in Omaha at that time. But we also know from Custer's schedule that the only chance he would have had for a photograph like this would have been on January 11th and probably in the, the later part of the afternoon. As soon as he and Sheridan got to town, they were touring around the city. Uh, and this was uh, the later afternoon was the only chance they would have had because the Grand Duke arrived the following morning and uh, just, just wouldn't have had the opportunity for that. And it's also noted uh, for Custer's cap. It's a, it's a seal skin cap. And uh, newspaper reports of the hunt later on talked about Custer and his buckskins and his flowing hair. And if he had not been wearing this comical sealskin cap, he would have both looked just like a Great Plains warrior hunting buffalo. So, so that photo we are able to, to pinpoint to Omaha. And uh, this is Custer and the Grand Duke. This is a photograph taken later in St. Louis of their, of their, uh, in their hunting gear uh, to help celebrate their adventures. But, Anyway, back into Nebraska. Uh, this is in southwest Nebraska. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody was their guide on this hunt, and he doesn't appear in any of the photographs at the site. He was out looking for buffalo, so he missed out on all the photography. But you can, you can see Custer there, and there's the Grand Duke right there, beginning of the hunt. Um, Eaton didn't join them on any of the, uh, any of the hunting part of this, so, so any, anything that we have uh, is a drawing or Characterization, characterization of, of the hunt like that, but the photographs are extremely limited. There are only five known to be, have been taken in camp. Of course, Custer was always ready for a photograph. Here's, the, here's Custer and the Brule Sioux Chief Spotted Tail outside the dining tent for, for camp, uh, camp Alexis. Uh, if you go to the site today, there is a state historical marker about a half mile south of the actual Camp Alexis site. And this is uh, about seven miles to the east of Hayes Center uh, in Nebraska. And do not try to get to this the day after a rainstorm. I, I did that, and I was coming from the long way. <laughs> it was about a half hour of terror <laughs> in trying to get to this place, just keeping the, keeping the car, uh, keeping the ass floored and trying to keep the wheels straight. But uh, eventually did find it. And uh, in following years, I did make contact with the landowner 
of the Camp Alexa site, and this is what that site looks like. Uh, they all encamped on this flat plateau overlooking the Red Willow Creek, and right below the lip of the, of the plateau there is a marker which commemorates the Grand Duke Alexis's visit and his hunting camp here. Uh, this is on private ground, of course. They did used to have an annual uh, celebration which they would bring people out to, but it, it's kind of died away in the last couple years. Uh, next up is Inyan Kara. This is uh, just outside of the Black Hills, and this is where Custer came in 1874 trying to find a way to get into the Black Hills. Uh, they're on their way to the formation to uh, presumably, look, presumably look for a, um, a fort location to, to build there, but also check out the rumors of gold in the Black Hills. Well, Custer was having a heck of a time finding an entrance to the Black Hills. Uh, if you know anything about the formation, it's actually kind of like an inverted bowl, and Custer was looking for a crack in that bowl to get, to get in there. So they made a climb of Inyan Kara in 1874 to, uh, to try to find a, a way to get in. Now before I go to the next photograph, this, this is a photograph taken at the time, but you can note the trees or, or lack of them on the slope of the mountain. That's what it looks like today and there are quite a few more, more trees in there. And uh, before I get into this, I'm, I want to give you a little bit of description about Indian Kara. It's a very unique formation. It's actually, they call it a mountain within a mountain. You've got this large knob in the center and then, uh, I'll make this, thing up. and surrounding it is kind of a horseshoe of a mountain. So to get to the top, uh, you have to climb one mountain, then climb another mountain uh, to, get to, to get to the souvenir that, that George Custer left behind. Um, the first time I visited, I didn't climb it at that point, but the weather was much nicer. Uh, the next time I came with my buddy Randy, and you do want to have somebody coming with you on these hikes because it's, this is one of those sites that could kill you if you're not careful. Uh, so the, the next time we came, uh, it was much cloudier, much rainier, much windier, which is, actually works out better because that pretty much takes the rattlesnakes out of your way. Uh, but he's indicating the path that we're going to take to get up to the, to the horseshoe there. And when you get on top of the horseshoe, this is what you have to deal with. You know, ideally you want to walk along the top of it because you've got 45 degree angles on both sides of the, of the thing. And, uh, but you can't always walk along the top of it because you've got this jagged volcanic rock popping out. You've got trees falling along the way, trees growing up in the way of that. So you definitely have to bring a walking stick just to keep yourself upright. There's all kinds of obstacles. There are no trails on Indian Kara. Absolutely no trails. And this is what we had to do. We walked on, along the entire rim of the horseshoe looking for the saddle that will get us onto that knob and uh, finally did make that. We actually, because of the trees, we couldn't see where that saddle was and actually went too far, but did come back and made the climb there. And uh, I do want to point out the, the fluted, uh, fluted sides here. That's similar to what you find at Devil's Tower, uh, Devil's Tower, which was formed at about the same time. But then you get up on this knob, and then you still got to make another climb <laughs> to another knob. It's, 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 a, it's a drooling, uh, grueling uh, trek up there about... Um, about two and a half hours for us to get to the top. But when you get there, there's this great souvenir of Custer that's waiting for you. And it's right here. You can't make it out that easily, so I use some drinking water to highlight the letters. But it reads 74 G. Custer. And when he was here in July of 1874, he and four officers and an engineer climbed to the top. And either one of the officers or the engineer uh, there's two newspapers reporting it, but uh, one of them carved his name into the into the summit of Inyan Kara, and uh, fantastic. I mean, they they didn't reach their didn't satisfy their purpose. They could not find an entrance to the Black Hills. They they found that on the ground the following day, but uh, they were very very impressed with what was up there, uh, and among that was the fantastic view. Uh, you start at about 5,000 feet in elevation. You go up to 6,600 feet by the time you're done. And it said on clear days you can see five states from up here, including Nebraska. Uh, this is about 40 miles from Devil's Tower. If the weather was clearer, we could have seen Devil's Tower from where we were in this photograph. And uh, at, the, at the bottom of the mountain, this is the Indian Care in the background, but it, next to the highway there are two 7th Cavalry graves. Uh, while Custer was up on top, two of his uh, troopers met their end. One of them died of diarrhea, and the other one died uh, being shot by a trooper he was having an argument with. But, but their graves are marked very close to Indian Kara there today. 
And then the next mountain, and my buddy and I actually climbed these mountains back to back, <laughs> which is kind of insane, but uh, we had to do it with our time frame. But this is Harney Peak, and George Custer wanted to be the first white man to climb it. This is the highest mountain between the Alps and the Rocky Mountains in the, in the, at the top of the Black Hills, and uh, he wanted to be among those that put his name on there for being the first to climb it. Of course, the Indians had been climbing it for many years. Black Elk uh, had his vision at the top of Harney Peak. This is where he had come. But uh, while the 7th Cavalry was in camp for, for about a week, this is where George Custer made his climb. Now, it's much easier climb than Indian Cara. There are nine trails leading to the summit today. Uh, here's Buddy Randy and joined by some friends, met, met some folks on the way down the, one of these trails. But also seated here is Paul Horstead, uh, noted author and photographer of, uh, of the Black Hills. And he's also going to be one of our speakers this year at the Omaha Westerners, uh, giving a talk on his, his latest book, Yellowstone, Yesterday and Today. But he was our guide for this, this part of the trip. And uh, see interesting things up there. And I don't, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Does anybody know what this is? That's right, Jim. That's the back of Mount Rushmore. I know you thought you'd see the hind ends of the presidents, but this is, this is actually what it looks like on the backside. And give you an idea on how high we actually are. Uh, Harney Peak is 7,200 7, feet, some plus feet high. But you not only see the top of Mount Rushmore, but you see for miles and miles beyond that. It's, it's, uh, we're really doing some heavy duty hiking here. It's really, really impressive. And eventually, this is what we're headed for. And there's two things I want to point out. One, of course, is the, uh, the lookout tower that had been built here for the observation of, uh, for forest fires. Uh, that's unoccupied now. People can climb that at will. But uh, Custer was looking for the summit, and this is what had been identified as the summit of Harney Peak. Well, they found out the following year that was not the summit. The summit was actually where the, where the lookout tower is now built. But uh, we were able to see both of these. And here's... Here's Paul Horstead. He's got a copy of the historical drawings made at the time, but he's pointing out the gap that Custer stood in uh, to identify that they had, had reached the summit. Uh, this is a photograph from the top of the, of the tower, and that's Horstead uh, seated there. But this gives you a fantastic view of the Black Hills. It is just absolutely uh, breathtaking. And uh, this is another look uh, to the side. There's Mount Rushmore there with the arrow pointed to it but it just kind of blends in with everything else that you see in the Black Hills. Uh, Custer, the other thing too, uh, just as they had a tough time finding their way into the Black Hills, they're also having a hard time finding a way out of the Black Hills. Uh, they had been in for about a week and a half at this point, and it was still going to be another two weeks before they got out. Um, really needed to find a way. And you know, Look at the terrain here. With a very large uh, regiment such as he had, with the, with the horses and the men, the wagons, supplies, everything like that, there weren't any roads in the Black Hills then, so very, very tough going through here. And they did have a tough time getting out of the Black Hills. Uh, but this is, this is the tower, and at the foot of the steps to the tower are the ashes of Valentine McGillicuddy, very, very well-known figure in Western history. Uh, he was there at the time Crazy Horse was killed at, at Fort Robinson. Uh, Tyler uh, Wasishu Wakan, holy white man. Um, as you can see, somebody tried to scratch out the holy part, but uh, he was the one that actually determined what the summit of Harney Peak was the year following Custer's visit, and he's, his ashes are there at the foot of the steps. Um, other interesting thing up on Harney Peak, there's actually a reservoir up there. Um, you don't have actual water services, <laughs> yeah, but you do have to have water up there, so they had built this, uh, this reservoir to capture, capture rainfall up there. Uh, next to last stop, Fort Abraham Lincoln, and this is Custer's, actually his first and last home on the Great Plain. Um, you know, being, being in, uh, in the cavalry, you're kind of mobile. This is the first time that the 7th Cavalry actually had a permanent home, and this is Custer's house right there. A uh, beautiful setting for this. This is about five miles below Bismarck on the Missouri River on the opposite bank. 
And uh, this is actually known as the Custer Post because he was the commander of it. And this was probably Custer's happiest times on the Great Plains because being in charge, he was able to move out people he didn't really care for. Uh, Captain Benteen got sent down to Fort Rice. Uh, Major Reno got sent up to Fort Totten. And Custer, in turn, was allowed to surround himself with family and friends uh, that were part of his group. And that's, that's one of the group shots on the steps of, of the Custer House. This is the third rendition of the Custer House. Um, first one destroyed by fire, the second one destroyed by vandals after, after the post closed. This is a reconstruction for the state park there. And they've reconstructed the interior as much as they could to Custer's time. Uh, these are not Custer's possessions, uh, but they were able to replicate the harpsichord and the harp and the, and the books on the shelf there. Um, of course, you see George and Libby at the piano there, or harpsichord, whatever that is. Uh, but uh, they've also recreated his, uh, his snuggery. We call it a den today, but back in that time it was called a snuggery. Uh, but that's George and Libby there, and they've reconstructed uh, part of that. Um, I'm also adding here, oh, you see the Sandhills crane there as well. Uh, but I've also added to the Lincoln site one more location. This is about 15 miles from Fort Abraham Lincoln. And this is the last encampment, uh, or the encampment for the night following the 7th Cavalry leaving on the Little Bighorn Expedition. This is where George and Libby Custer said their last farewells, not knowing it was their last farewell. But they encamped on the Hart River here about 15 miles from the fort. And then the following morning made the crossing across the ford of the Hart River out into the, out into the Great Plains. And then finally, uh, Little Bighorn. This is Custer's last stand, and this is the site that everybody associates with George Custer. Uh, so, of course, I have to include this in the presentation there, but there's, there's actually quite a bit more to, to Little Bighorn than you're probably familiar with. Of course, everybody comes, or I would guess 90% of those who do attend or do uh, visit uh, Little Bighorn make the climb from the visitor center up to Last Stand Hill. Uh, this is the mass grave of the soldiers that were fought there. Uh, the wrought iron fence here overlooks the, the rest of Last Stand Hill where Custer and the other members of his command fell. And of course Custer's, Custer's marker is blacked out to make it easier to identify but also as the, as the commander here. Uh, these are not graves. These are merely markers that show where they fell, where the bodies were, were found. Um, many people do go on, take the five mile trek down to the Reno Benteen. Oh, let me, before I get to that, uh, while you are at the visitor center, do make care uh, to, to visit the Custer Battlefield National Cemetery. A lot of personalities here from the Indian Wars, including uh, Marcus Reno. He was buried here in 18, or excuse me, 1967, I believe, but I have to check on that. Uh, Custer Scout Curley is also buried here. But what I was going to talk about was the Reno Benteen Battlefield. This is the other aspect of Little Bighorn that many people don't talk about. Uh, but this is a marker at that site, and you can have take a little trail uh, with interpretive markers to talk about that aspect of the battle. But along the way, you'll you'll pass through Weir Point. This is the high point of the of the battlefield. Uh, this is where maybe the last vision of our site of George Custer took place when Thomas Weir tried to tried to reach them, and they did see troops fighting, uh, but had to had to turn back, being repulsed. But Along that way, there are several other graves that uh, you can stop and make note of, including Mark Kellogg, who was the uh, reporter that accompanied them, uh, filing dispatches from the, from the track for the New York Herald. Uh, he's identified as actually the first battle casualty for the Associated Press. This is where, <laughs> this is where that began. He was, he was embedded with the troops in, in this campaign. And of course, also uh, uh, Miles Keough, the, uh, the Irish soldier who fought for the 7th Cavalry. And then uh, outside of the park, uh, you know, get down to Little Bighorn. I mean, this is where the Indian village was. It's a beautiful river, uh, fascinating. And close to this are the, are the sites where uh, Custer's chief of scouts, Charlie, Charlie Reynolds, fell. Uh, also his interpreter, Isaiah Dorman, a uh, black man who uh, had been married into the, to the, the, Sioux, um, the Sioux tribe. And uh, if you get a little more adventuresome, you can visit the morass. Uh, this is where Custer waddled, wa excuse me, watered his horses for the last time before the battle. And if you're even more adventuresome, you can go up to Crow's Nest. And this is where Custer supposedly saw the, uh, the Indian village for the first time or was told by his uh, guides that he was looking at the Indian village. 
and uh, the book tells you how to get to all these places. These aren't, these aren't featured sites, but it does tell you what you have to do to get to them. And it even tells you the right time to get to Little Bighorn if you want to see George Custer and the 7th Cavalry uh, moving down the battlefield again. So, uh, but those are the, um, those are the, what I call the 10 must-see sites of, of Custer on the Great Plains. You know, there's a couple more I could have substituted, but uh, this, I think, gives you a really good idea of what's, what's out there, not, not just for the, for the man-made um, attractions, but also the natural features of the Great Plains that are, that are still there and still uh, inviting you to visit them. It's a, it's a fantastic land, and Custer got to see the best of it, I think, when he was on the Great Plains, uh, Great Plains and I hope you take the opportunity to visit these sites as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy to field any questions. Yes, sir. The Republican River uh, mm -hmm. with. If I'm standing in front of that sign on Highway 30, where was the actual campground from here? It was about a half mile to the north, if I recollect right. Um, I, I've looked at the maps, and I'm trying to figure out. I know if I was in Benkelman, I could get you right there. <laughs> but at the time, I'm trying to think of the orientation where it was. But I think it's about a half mile to the north of where the marker is. Is it right on the river then? Or on the, the encampment? Yeah. It's, no, it's not right on the river. It's very, very close to the river, though. Uh, the, I think the marker itself is closer to the river. Um, just a few hundred feet from that, I believe. But, but the seventh was really kind of you know, spread out there as well. So um, where the horse herd actually was, where that, where that was located when the, when the Sioux tried to drive them away, I'm not sure. But you're, you're within about a stone's throw of, of about anything at that point. Yep. Great. Yes, sir? You've told us some things about Custer's personality by mentioning like photographs mm -hmm. of himself. Um, I gather if he was in trouble a lot, he perhaps was impetuous. Uh, you could call him impetuous. Um, <laughs> what would be some other things you tell us about him? Uh, well, his stamina was incredible. I, I just can't get over what uh, what he did. You know the strength that he had for for existing out here on the Great Plains because um, you knew how hard he was on his troops. I mean, he didn't work them any harder than he worked himself. So there, there's something about him that that led to that. But uh, he would ride for miles and miles and miles. And then this is when he was in Black Hills, or also when he was passing through the Badlands. But after, you know, after a hard day of marching, he would pen 40-page you know, articles for a magazine and then a 12-page letter to his wife and then uh, do some fossil hunting and taxidermy and, and all of these things. So, I mean, he was, he was well-rounded. But the guy who had to be getting by on just like four or five hours of sleep a night, it seems like, uh, he just had energy that uh, was nonstop. It just, just really astounds me. That's one aspect of him I just can't get over is the, is the, is the stamina that he, that he brought with himself to, the, to this particular job. So that's one thing. As far as, as, far as negative characteristics, I guess that fa falls in with that as well. He didn't really have a lot of consideration for his men and, and the suffering that they were going through. Uh, in fact, he, he treated his dogs better than he treated his soldiers. Uh, the dogs would often be riding in the wagons if they had to, if they gotten gotten exhausted. They sometimes were fed better than the men were, but uh, but um, that was that was part of what made Custer kind of an interesting and complex personality as well. So, yes, sir. Wasn't there a little controversy when after <clears throat> Lieutenant Kidder's squad got massacred uh, because Gus mm -hmm. Custer failed mm -hmm. to follow Sherman's orders and return to Fort Sedgwick to pick up his orders? Yeah, the question was about controversy in Custer and not picking up his orders at the time of the Kidder massacre. Uh, Custer was kind of doing things that he, you wouldn't expect them to do. I mean, as far as, um, I think he had sent Major Elliott to Sed, uh, Fort Sedgwick, I believe, instead of going there himself, and he had been, uh, Custer's story at the time of the, um, of the of the, uh, the court martial was that he was looking for to resupply his troops. Well, not really. <laughs> I mean, he, I, I think it's, it's been proven he was pretty much looking for Libya at the time. All supplies a couple hundred miles 
to get to Fort Wallace when the railroad train brought them right to Fort Sedgwick. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a part of it. That, that's that grass might be a little too tall for me there on what uh, what what he was looking at or looking for in, in in the course of that. But I get into that a little bit in the book. But uh, you know, as far as the that relates to the travel on there, but uh, there was there was I probably got to say some fast and loose interpretation of orders at at that time to uh, meet his own personal objectives. I think so. That, that doesn't help much, but <laughs> that's what I've got. Let's Custer see. Have any children? Custer never did have any children. So, uh, supposedly, some uh, gossip said that he had a child with one of the uh, one of the Indian women who were captured at uh, at the Battle of the Washita. Um, that's never been proven or substantiated. Uh, supposedly, the woman that he did have a child with was already with child, already pregnant at the time of the of the battle. So. I don't know, and there, there's also rumors that uh, that uh, Custer had uh, had an STD that would have kept him from having any children to begin with, too. So, it's there's a lot of their uh, the letters between Custer and his wife uh, were destroyed uh, to um, I guess kind of to protect their reputations. There may have been something in there that would have said any, something more about their their lack of children, but it's. It's, I, I hate to even conjecture about that because there's there's really no way of, of knowing that. But I, as far as I know, I don't I don't think he ever did have any children with with his wife or with anybody else. So, so did the court martial? Uh, did it actually result in a trial? Then, uh, he, he was court martialed and he was found guilty, uh, suspended for a year without pay. But because of um, you know the, this implementation of the of the new new plan and with Phil Sheridan taking over for General Hancock. Uh, Sheridan was a big fan of Custer and he wanted him out there and uh, supposedly a vote among the officers of the men of the seventh, or the officers of the seventh, uh, they were requesting Custer come back as well. So his, um, his suspension was I think shortened by about four months if I remember right, something like that. So, uh, but he and, he and Libby um, always felt that he was being held as a scapegoat for for General Hancock, whose campaign that summer never did produce any results. So um, he, they, he, they saw themselves as, or he saw himself as a scapegoat for that. So. Yes, sir. When they were trying to get out of the Badlands, did they use their own provisions? Did they have enough, or did they have to shoot game locally? Uh, Custer was uh, was a big hunter for the uh, uh, during the trek through the Badlands. Uh, both of them. Uh, the first one in 1873, that, that's kind of an interesting thing. I talk about that in the book as well. But uh, while uh, General Stanley was, was drunk, Custer would often go off hunting on his own. And uh, it got to the point, uh, Custer had been, uh, I think he was about 15 miles away from the main column and sent back a, a messenger asking for supplies. And at that point, uh, Stanley had him arrested. Uh, released him the next day, but, but Custer much preferred to be off on his own and doing his own hunting and you know bringing back game for the for at least the officers on that so yeah he he had a, he had an independent streak that's for sure so. yes sir is there any association between Custer and Fort Leavenworth isn't his brother buried at Leavenworth uh, Thomas Custer is buried at Leavenworth along with um, two other officers from the 7th Cavalry that were killed at Little Bighorn uh, yeah there's a very strong tie in with with uh, with Custer at Fort Leavenworth, um, he lived there, of course, during it, it in what's now. Uh, I've got a photograph of it in the book, but the, there's a large house there, as the post sutler's quarters that he lived in during his uh, during his quarter martial. Now, the actual building where the quarter or um, court martial took place, uh, that building is no longer there. That's a that's a parking lot now, uh, but they do have a depiction of the building at the time, and. Um, there are other sites at Fort Leavenworth associated with him. The museum has several pieces, including a um, uh, a sleigh that he had built for himself at Fort Leavenworth uh, for transportation during the winter. So, yes, sir, you had a question. You speak a little about how he uh, 
Uh, he definitely the the fastest rising officer in the, during the Civil War. Uh, you know, for a guy that finished dead last in his class at <laughs> at West Point, I mean, he went from a second lieutenant to a major general in uh, three years. I mean, at the age of 23, um, he had he had three stars at the time, which is which is really incredible. Uh, you know, a lot of that was you know being at the right place at the right time in front of the right people, but. No one can deny that uh, he showed incredible bravery during the Civil War. Um, he had 11 horses shot out from underneath him, and two of them on the same day at Gettysburg. And uh, it, it can be said that the Union probably was saved uh, at Gettysburg by his his uh, charges against um, against um, Jeb Stewart. Thank you very much. Appreciate that uh, by repul uh, repulsing Jeb Stewart. Um, you know. That, that definitely kept the Confederacy from from wrapping around the Union that day. So, uh, yeah, his his Civil War credentials uh, very much proven out on the on the field there. So, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you again very very much. Um, I know the gift shop does have copies of the book. Uh, I'd be more than happy to to autograph it for you. But this will this will tell you how to get to these ten sites and about seventy five other sites. It tells you some of them are a little tricky, and this will tell you how to <laughs> how to maneuver that to get to get to those places. But again, I appreciate you very very much for coming out in such a such a brisk uh, spring day. <laughs> it's, it's really really nice. But thank you again.